Okay, first, let's try to get the volume okay, because I can talk pretty loud when I get excited. Uh, and American elections are an exciting topic, for sure. Is the volume okay? Is it too loud? It's a little bit loud, yeah. Well, we'll see how it goes. But uh, first of all, thank you all for, for coming out during a uh, pandemic, risking, uh, risking it all to learn about uh, science, which is great. And thank you to the organizers for putting together a, uh, a hybrid event. Uh, I was really hoping that we'd be able to do something. I know all of you are sort of craving some in-person time, right? You're doing a lot of Zoom calls, but uh, it's also for us professors. Like we like to actually engage with people. So, uh, so I'm excited to do this. And uh, so hello to everyone that's tuning in on the live stream. I want to give a special shout out to my, uh, my baby who's going to turn four years old in a few weeks. But it's not a human baby. <laughs> it's my podcast, uh, Social Media and Politics, um, which I started just before the 2016 US election. And in each episode, I interview uh, a leading digital campaigner. We're talking about people who work for the uh, Trump campaign, uh, Kamala Harris's campaign, and really get insight into how they are using social media in their campaigns. Also a lot of interviews with um, people working for large European institutions and top social media scholars in political science. We're talking about like the best of the best. Uh, I get them on the podcast and we dig into their research, um, as well as some kind of people who, you know, um, are sort of leaders in the social media space, whether they're creating alternative social media platforms like Gab or Minds, or uh, moderators of popular subreddits like the Donald. Uh, I just sort of interview them and hear about their work. So uh, if you're thinking about writing a research paper or a master's thesis, uh, there's tons and tons of material here. And um, so I definitely recommend checking that out. And the reason that I'm starting this presentation with this is that as we go through the lecture, if there is a podcast that deals with the topic that I'll be talking about, I'll show you where that is and you can go and uh, find out more information with the expert who has done that study or has worked in that part of a campaign. So it's, uh, it's kind of cool. And um, yeah, one electoral cycle old, so kind of cool. So what am I gonna be talking about in this lecture? We're gonna discuss the science behind what we actually know about political advertising on social media, the type of content that politicians post, and we'll talk a little bit about fake news and disinformation. Uh, the abstract for this lecture was meant to be a little bit uh, clickbaity with fake news and Russian trolls. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end, and then we can take that into the questions and answers um, if you'd like to discuss more. What this lecture is not going to be about is about Trump versus Biden. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that this election is ongoing, so we don't have much scientific evidence about what's really happening there. Uh, the other thing is that this is a one presidential election when there's dozens, hundreds of elections that are going on in the US uh, in 2020. So it's sort of unfair to focus on just the top one. It's very important, but it is a small part and unlike a lot of campaigns that happen in the United States. But I want to start this lecture, and the reason I want to focus so much on science is because uh, thinking about it, there's sort of a narrative about social media, right? We have these platforms, and the narrative goes that they're changing our media and our politics. And in terms of how they're changing our media, the argument goes something like this. Because of social media platforms, we have things that didn't exist before social media. These are things like micro-targeted political ads, echo chambers and filter bubbles, fake news, and the latest one now is deep fakes. And the argument is that these phenomenon are made possible or amplified because of social media platforms. And in terms of how that's changing our politics, we have things like voter manipulation because of political ads, or the polarization of society because of echo chambers. Right? People are getting more divided because they're living in echo chambers online. Foreign uh, actors, Russia, China, Iran, are changing the outcome of elections because of fake news. Or deep fakes are going to corrode democracy and decrease trust. Do you recognize some of these narratives, this type of argument? Well, a lot of this isn't really backed by science. And so I think it's kind of sweet. And this is the molecular structure of sugar, sucrose. It's a compound that's made up of two other molecules, glucose and fructose. 
And what I want to basically represent here is that when we think about media and politics, within themselves, there are these massive structural factors that influence the media landscape and the political landscape. And what sort of combines these large structures in the narrative is these social media platforms. And the story, the fake news and the deep fakes, it's sweet, it's easily digestible, it makes sense, it's easy. But when we look at the science behind, for example, the media landscape, there are really, really large structural factors that influence how we consume news and how media is used for politics, where social media is just a part of that. So we have things like media markets. I'll talk more about those as we go along. We have an overall lower quality of journalism than we had in the 50s and 60s. We have the increasingly uh, biased media in the left and the right in the United States. We have people's consumption habits change over time with different media technologies. If you look at the political system, we have things like how the electoral system works. In the US, we have a first past the post system, meaning it's winner take all for every state. Right? In Sweden, when you cast a vote, it goes towards a percentage of that party. In the United States and in the UK, it's winner takes all. This, is, <laughs> this affects politics, I think, a lot more than, for example, social media does. The fact that the US has a two-party system, just the Republicans and the Democrats, makes it very easy to talk about polarization because you only have two parties. The laws and regulations that are in place lead to a massive amount of money in American politics. So the point I'm trying to make with this example is that if you only focus on social media, you have this type of sweet narrative that seems to make sense, but you're ignoring these other massive, massive factors that all have a great influence on elections. And so the argument is that if we only focus on these sugary narratives and not the science behind it, we can get something like this, where when science finally catches up and sort of cuts through some of the media narratives with evidence-based research, maybe everything we've been hearing about social media is a little bit of cake. So one way we can look at social media uh, more broadly is from a historical perspective. And while social media is super cool technologies, they revolutionize how we communicate, there's been other transformations before with media. So we think about the US. The first big media communication technology that was relevant for politics was the newspaper. Boring old newspapers, right? They used to be made out of sheepskin. They were very dangerous to make, and they were very expensive. Only, we're talking about colonial times here, like 1700s, the 13 colonies. Only rich people could afford newspapers because they were so expensive. And newspapers have always been tied with politics. And basically, what this led to was a sort of class division between the wealthy who could be informed about politics and had a bigger role in influencing elections because they were politically informed whereas people who couldn't afford newspapers didn't really know what was going on. So the situation was like that for a couple hundred years. Eventually, newspapers got cheaper. Everyone could afford them. And we move to the next major uh, transformation, which was the radio and politicians using the radio. The classic fireside chats in the 1930s and 40s, where you had politicians communicating directly to people in their homes with something new, that audio element. And what's important to note is how the way that political actors use these technologies has differed. Because when you're communicating through radio, it's one person broadcasting out to millions of people. Then we had television, which was another innovation that changed the way people consume news and got informed about politics. And while television is massively powerful because it's visual, it's not a big change from the radio to the television. Right? You have a small number of channels that are broadcasting to people who basically listen or watch TV in the same way with their families. So we have a major, major innovation with the internet. And the internet is different than radio and television because now we have citizens who can communicate with each other and they can also produce their own content. 
So what makes the internet different from all these other older forms of technology is that not, it's not that people are just receiving broadcasted information. People can actually start to broadcast their own information through blogs, for example. And that brings us to social media, which isn't really much different than the internet if we think of it like this, in the sense that citizens can connect with each other and produce their own content. It's not so much different from the internet, but it is a big step from television and radio. So why am I talking about this old stuff? Or the, this is about the social media and elections. We can also look at these technologies that failed for politics, things like the telegraph and the telephone, which were hugely important in their time. Everyone had a, tele uh, a telephone in their home, but it didn't really become used by politicians because you, you would have to call every person, right? Millions of people. It, it wasn't worth it. So when we look at what failed and what didn't, and this is what um, uh, Dr. Ben Epstein, DePaul University in Chicago, he says, when we look at the newspaper, the radio, and the internet, we can see that they follow a pattern. He calls it the political communication cycle. And the first thing that happens is you have a major information technology uh, innovation. That's something like the radio. Someone develops the technology for the radio. Over time, it becomes more popular and less expensive, right? Economies of scale. Everyone can afford a radio at some point. At that point, politicians start to take notice. They say, there's a radio in everyone's home, or there's a computer in everyone's home. Maybe I can use this to get elected. So as we move into this second phase, we have initial attempts. So we have first adopters using the technology. And then we eventually have the successful use of a new technology. So if we think about social media and the internet, that would be Obama, 2008. Right? I mean, Obama made an incredible use of social media. True, but he wasn't the first. One of the first politicians to use the internet was Howard Dean in 2004, and he lost. So just using a technology well doesn't mean you'll win. But eventually, someone will win who used it, and then other people start to copy. Once you start having a bunch of politicians that are using a new technology in a similar way, you reach a point where it's sort of just the norm. And this is where we are with social media. Every politician has a social media account. They use it to message their supporters. But the last phase is when a, um, the use of a technology basically becomes regulated by the government. And there's rules and laws put in place around it. And what he argues is that with these three politi political communication technologies, one being the newspaper, two being the radio and television, because they're quite similar in broadcasting, and the third major revolution being the internet and social media, as soon as a new technology comes along, we move into a new order. So this cycle repeats itself. And if we think about social media, we're here. Meaning everyone's using social media for politics, using it to campaign. And we're right before these companies start to get regulated. Right? Is Facebook a monopoly or not? Will it be busted up? And if we follow history, that means that we're on the cusp of revolution number four, which could be something like I don't know, you know, uh, microchips in your brain, like Neuralink type stuff, or, or uh, augmented reality or virtual reality. So we're ending the life cycle of the internet and social media. But the reason that I wanted to go through this is to show you that while social media is new and cool and trending, we can see patterns also from television, radio, and the newspaper. So when we take this longer perspective, we start to get a better idea about this hype around social media has happened before. And it's happened before a few times. And it will probably happen again. You can hear more about this in episode 103 of the podcast, where we break it down in more detail. But let's move on to Facebook advertising, right? Because this is uh, one of the key advantages of social media 
that makes it different from radio and newspapers. Often called micro-targeting, the cooler way to put it. So the question is, why do politicians advertise on Facebook? And in order to understand this, we need to compare social media to the last large communication technology, which is television. Another reason to think about things in a historical context. And what we know from research on television is that political ads, they can create small persuasive effects. They're not going to dram dramatically change how someone thinks about a politician or votes. But what they can do is they can move someone from not voting for a politician to maybe undecided. Small effect. And that effect will decrease over two weeks, is the general idea. So that's why politicians constantly advertise on television, because they have to keep that effect up. If they, just add, if they just run one ad, someone might change their mind a little bit, but then two weeks later, that ad has no effect. So how does social media compare to television? Because television is still um, one of the most widely used technology mediums in the US. And there's a great study that just came out in the American Political Science Review that gives us the broadest understanding of Facebook advertising to date, because they compare it to television ads. So they looked at all Facebook ads and all television ads across the United States in 2018. It's a lot of ads. But to understand why social media is so useful to politicians, we have to understand designated market areas, what are called DMAs. And what a DMA is, is an area where you can advertise on television or radio. So if you're going to run an ad here, your ad's going to be broadcast on this entire area. There's 210 digital market areas, sorry, designated market areas in the United States. But there's 435 congressional districts. This is where politicians run for um, the House of Representatives. So these don't overlap. So I want you to look at a part of the map for about five seconds, and then we'll change over to the, uh, the DMAs. Ready? Boom. Halloween. No, seriously, uh, <laughs> coming up later this, this month. Um, so keep your eye on a part of a, pick a, pick a district where you would run for Congress. And there's the DMA. They don't overlap. So you might run for Congress here, but there's these different media markets. So if you're trying to advertise, it's difficult because you might have to advertise in three different media markets. So let's look at an example of how this works. We can talk about it a bit more closely. The state of California has 14 media markets and 53 congressional districts. So let's say you're running in District 1. That happens to be this guy, Doug LaMalfa. He's the congressman. So if you're Doug and you say your polling is telling you, I need to advertise to voters here in this media market, that means you're also advertising in that media market. You see how it works? Because these are the same. They're kind of drawn weird. So that means if you run a television ad where you need to run it up here, it's also going to be broadcast all the way over here, which is OK. That's most of your constituency. But you're also advertising there, which is in District 3. If you need to run a television ad in that part of the country, in that part of your district, that's OK that fits in your district. Is this making sense? Yeah? If you advertise in that media market, it's also going to be shown down here, it's the same media market, which means you're also advertising in District 8. If you need to hit this little corner, just over here in your district, you're also advertising there, which is in District 4 and all these other crazy districts. So at some point, you're throwing money away because you're advertising to voters who can't even vote for you, because they're over here, right? So what Facebook allows you to do is to not advertise based on media market, but advertise based on location. And so in a case where your media markets are not really aligning with your district, 
Facebook becomes a better tool for you because you can basically avoid wasting money by advertising all over the place to voters who can't vote for you. And this is what this shows. Um, in that study, they looked at the state level, so not individual, but in the state level, and they found that, indeed, people who are in your state are more likely to see your Facebook ads than they are your television ads. Because these media markets can spill over into other states, and you're advertising in a completely different state. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, which is, if you look at this difference between the market areas and the congressional districts, we can also estimate what would happen if the media market and the district don't overlap at all, and what happens when they're perfectly together. So what hap if they're perfectly together, that means that if you were to advertise to the media market, it would perfectly cover your constituency. That's good for you. Well, the results show that if you have Facebook and TV ads, and they're running, if the media market does not overlap at all, they're two different things, the media market in the um, congressional district, you're about, you spend about the same money on each. It's not a big deal. If you have a perfect alignment between the market area and your congressional district, the estimates show that you're likely to spend $890,000 less on Facebook. So what that means is that if politicians have a media market where they can advertise on TV and it aligns perfectly with their district, they're not likely to spend money on Facebook at all. They will always choose TV. Not always, but the statistics show strong effect for TV. But if you're Doug and you don't have a good alignment between the media market and your district, that's where Zuckerberg has got you. You're going to pay a lot more money to Facebook to target just what you need. So one of the advantages, probably the primary advantage of Facebook advertising is precision. And the reason it's so powerful is not because Facebook ads are some magic persuasive bullet. They fill a gap in the structural media market. Part of the reason Facebook is used so much relates to these structural factors I was talking about, the media market. So this graph shows for each candidate, their average of spending on Facebook and television, and the lines represent different levels of government. So the US Senate is kind of the most prestigious, it takes the most money, to win the Senate, then you have governor races, um, the House of Representatives, and then each state has a Senate and House. So these are, as you go up, as the lines get darker, it's harder to win and it's more expensive. And here we have the data showing is the candidate for each race more likely to spend on Facebook or more likely to spend on TV? And what it shows, remember the darker bars are more expensive races, higher up in government. What it basically shows is that they spend on both, Facebook and TV. But who's more likely to spend on Facebook is your state and Senate races, the cheapest, because they can't afford television. Because remember, if you have to advertise to a whole media market, you have to buy the advertising for that entire span of the country. So it's much cheaper for you to use Facebook. And so what this shows is that basically um, those who really rely on Facebook, who need it for those campaigns, are those without much money. Because Facebook advertising is cheaper than buying a television slot. And you can target people based on specific interests, like gardening or news, or you can message your followers directly for free. Doug doesn't have many Instagram followers, unfortunately. He's got to work on that a bit. So one of the advantages of Facebook advertising is cost. It's cheaper. Why is it so cheap? So just like in Sweden, in the US, you have programs on television that are predetermined, right? Like 
You don't really change the order of shows a week before, right? They're scheduled. So let's think about Doug running for the uh, Senate this time. And his campaign, think about it, to create an ad, you need a production team, you need, um, you need editors. It costs, it costs quite a bit of money to run an ad. And the process for how they choose what to say in these ads is really interesting. And uh, episode 52 of the pod, we talked to uh, the person who did the uh, TV ads for Hillary Clinton, which is really interesting. So if you're Doug's campaign, you gotta figure out where do you wanna put your ad? Change it to NBC to make it more uh, US. You can put it after the home and garden show if you need to hit older women. You can put it at the seven o'clock news if that's where you think your ad is gonna um, hit voters. But you don't really know who's gonna be watching. You have to just kind of guess based on um, the TV program. But what happens if you check Twitter and Trump is going to come to a rally in your state? He's going to support your opponent in the election. Well, now you've got a Trump-Pence rally when you were planning to advertise. And the cost to advertise in that slot just went up a lot. Because there's going to, everyone's going to be watching the Trump rally. And you didn't buy your ad yet, but now you can't afford it because the cost to advertise during the Trump rally just went up hundreds of thousands of dollars, whatever it is. But Donald Trump probably communicated with your opponent and said, buy these now, because tomorrow I'm gonna announce that we have a rally. And so there's a strategic aspect of where Trump might not necessarily go and rally just to support somebody. There could be some backstage dynamics where he's basically trying to block out Doug because Doug can't afford to advertise here, but his opponent can. Kind of backdoor campaigning. A lot of cool stuff going on. We talk about all this ad buying stuff in episode 74. And also, interestingly, nowadays, of course, there's streaming television. So you can go what's called over the top, meaning you don't have to deal with these programming issues because now people can advertise on Hulu and things like that, which gives you more data. Very cool stuff. But what can you do if you're Doug? The president's coming and I can't afford to advertise on TV. Well, you can turn to social media. So these are some examples from Biden after he won the um, South Carolina primary, which really propelled him. It was his first big win that really kind of kicked off his whole ride to the nomination. Right after he won, he starts send sending these ads, donate now. You don't have to develop a whole TV commercial you don't have to plan weeks and months in advance where you're gonna put it. You just take a picture, donate now. Here's another example. Trump said something outrageous in the paper. Go figure. Uh, but if you want, you can take this event, this outrageous thing Trump did, and you can turn it into an ad and try to basically get money or donations from people who are angered by this ad. And it only takes a few hours to do that versus booking a slot months in advance for a TV program. So that's another advantage of Facebook advertising, which is time. But also, you have these buttons, right? To donate or to sign up for the campaign. And whether you click it or not, Facebook is harvesting this data. And that can be useful for you. And you can't overstate you know, the fact that you can see an ad on Facebook and then click to donate. You can't do that on TV. I mean, there's touchscreen TVs, but people don't walk over to their TV and start donating, right? So the functionality of Facebook, being able to have these buttons and shorten the time and effort it takes to donate is another advantage. So why do politicians advertise on Facebook? Precision, cost, time, and functionality. These are four key areas. There's more, but these are the ones that I think are really important. So what do candidates actually post on social media? Not issues. That much we know. They do not post about policy on social media. We have some research that shows this. A um, little older. You know, publishing papers takes a long time, but from 
the uh, 2010 Senate races comparing TV ads and Twitter, only 5% of TV ads did not include an issue. So that means 95% were talking about something, whether it's healthcare or uh, economy, jobs, something like that. Whereas over half of tweets mentioned no issue at all. So take a quick detour. Um, I'm working on a study that looks at the Facebook and Twitter posts by Clinton and Trump from 2016. And what we're trying to find out is to what extent do politicians post the same thing on different platforms? Or why do they say one thing on Facebook versus one thing on Twitter? Are they attacking more on Twitter uh, versus asking for money on Facebook? Kind of seems to be the case. So we took their Facebook and Twitter posts over the course of uh, what's generally thought of as the general election from September to November. And what's uh, posted just on Twitter is the Twitter blue. What's posted on Facebook is the Facebook blue. And then what was the same message posted to the two different platforms is gold for Clinton and for Trump. What we find is that 60% of Clinton's Facebook posts were also posted on Twitter. So it doesn't seem that there was so much of a big strategic difference between the two platforms. We did find, doing some content analysis, that uh, the Clinton campaign only messaged um, Hispanics in Spanish on Facebook. Kind of interesting, because when we look at the uh, demographic data of who's using these platforms, there's not many Hispanics on Twitter. So it makes sense they would do that. So that's one difference. but. If you look at this, so this is the raw numbers per day, and this is the proportion. So for each day, what percentage of social media messages were cross-platform, Facebook specific, or Twitter specific? And we see that um, there's quite a bit of cross-platform posting. So there's a couple reasons for this. It could be that even though social, um, social media posts take less sort of time and money than putting together a television ad, you still need to put the content together. You still need to find the picture, decide what you're going to write. And when campaigns are under a lot of stress, maybe they just put out the same message to a large audience. And we think that uh, more important messages that the campaign really wants to send will be sent to both platforms because you have a bigger audience. Right? If you need, you know, go vote today is probably going to be on all platforms. Right? You want as many people to see that. So. <laughs> this is kind of yeah, still working through this data. Um, this is kind of what it looks like on the back end. But what we find is that when we compare these different types of actions, so we have things like um, when do politicians attack on cross-platform, when do they call voters to action, we really find differences in how the politicians, between Clinton and Trump, we find pretty major differences in how they use social media. But what's Basically, the strongest signal we get is that they are very unlikely to post issues on both platforms, which is kind of, uh, kind of interesting. We also find that uh, both Trump and Clinton are more likely to attack on Twitter, uh, with Trump being very, very likely to attack on Twitter, which uh, yeah, kind of makes sense. So going back to that Facebook and ad study, everything left of this bar is more likely to be on television. And we see across all these issues, abortion, drugs, economy, education, everything is more likely to be on TV, with maybe the exception of environment and abortion. So social media just isn't the place for uh, discussing policy. But one thing we can do is we can look at the tone of ads on TV versus Facebook. And one way to do that is to look at to what extent do candidates promote themselves. So we'll take Biden as an example. So a promotion ad for Biden would just mention Biden. A contrast ad would try to put the politician in contrast with the opponent. So both candidates would be mentioned. An attack ad would just mention the opponent. So everything left of this line is more likely to be on TV and everything to the right is more likely to be on Facebook. Do you think attack ads are more likely to be on TV or Facebook? Take your bets. Do you want to put one up? No, I'm just guessing Facebook. 
TV. Good guess, though. I would have thought the same. Contrast. TV or Facebook? Da -da -da. TV. Promoting the candidate? Way more likely on Facebook. Which is kind of interesting, because like you, I would have thought that Facebook ads have all this nasty attacks, right? Because no one can really see uh, that content. It's not public. So we're going to take a detour, and we're going to go into what I'm most excited to talk about in this talk, which is uh, some research I've been doing on emotions in politics. And this is like super fresh stuff. I'm like, yeah, was putting these graphs together yesterday. Uh, but we've been working on this project for a few months. So early data, but kind of cool. So we're interested in looking at what are the emotions that candidates display through their facial expressions on Facebook ads. Because most of the research on social media studies text, the content of messages through text, but we all know that images and video are where social media is most powerful, right? And a lot of existing research looks at sentiment analysis. So they classify whether a tweet is positive or negative. But there's a lot more nuance in emotions besides positive or negative. Right? Negative emotions can be angry, they can be sad, they can be fearful. So we wanted to develop something that could classify the faces in politicians uh, using facial detection and computer vision. Before I get into that, though, I have to give you the science behind it, or what the theory says. And the theory says that there are two main systems that people process emotions with. The first is called the disposition system. And there's two kind of broad categories within that. One is a scale of enthusiasm. So you can be happy or sad, and there's a bunch of emotions in between happiness and sadness. There's also um, a category called aversion. This is things like anger and disgust. Like, I don't even want to deal with that, right? These emotions, even though they're different, are argued to have similar effects, which is they make people make decisions based on their habits and the beliefs they already have, and they tend to mobilize people to donate or to vote. So if you're like someone who's anti-immigration and you get angry, a politician makes you angry about immigration, you're more likely to make decisions based on your anti-immigration sentiment and you're more likely to vote. This is what the literature says broadly. There's also a system called the surveillance system, and this is basically about fear. How scared are you? So you have fear, anxiety, and the other side you have calm, right? They're kind of opposites. And these have a different effect. So if you're scared, if you're fearful, you don't rely on what you already think. You tend to look for new information, but you're less likely to vote. So if you actually make people scared, my candidate is going to start a war and kill your family, you're less likely to actually go out and vote. It's how we process emotions. So if we look at what Facebook ads are going on right now, this is from last night, just the first thing when I typed in Donald Trump, no lie. Um, you'll see that they look pretty nasty, right? But what are the emotions that are being communicated here? That's what we want to figure out. So Facebook has this ad library. Have any of you heard of it? No? You can Google Facebook ad library, and you can go and you can search all the ads that politicians are running and all the ads they've ever ran up until like 2018 or something. You can filter, um, like up here, it can be Sweden, US. Kind of cool if you need a project to do, again, for like a thesis. You can go and you can collect ads from the Facebook ad library. And you can search by who's, who's spending them. Are they on Facebook or Instagram? Stuff like that. And you can also click the summary, and you can get some more information about the ad, like how much was spent. In this case, less than $100, which is not a lot of money, right? So politicians test different versions. And when they find ones that are successful, then they invest more. You can see how many people saw the ad, four to 5,000. You can see the um, gender breakdown by age. 
So here we see that these kind of nasty Biden ads were targeted to young males up to about age 45, 54. And they were only targeted in the state of Maine, this particular one. So this is the kind of information that Facebook is now allowing the public and researchers to see. The problem is, like, this is cool, it's nice, but you can't really look at this for every single ad. But what you can do is you can get the data directly from Facebook, which looks like this. So this is, um, for any of you kind of computer science-y people, um, this is what happens, or the, the type of data output you get from their API, which is when you basically request a bunch of data from Facebook. The best way they can give it to you is in this crazy spreadsheet where you have things, basically all the information that's here is in here, just in a spreadsheet form, so we can analyze it. But what's missing is the images. And so one of the reasons that most of the social media research is focused on text is because we get text from the platforms. But what we have is the link to what I just showed you before, the image and everything like that. So I've been working with a for former student of mine and we developed a tool, we call it the Facebook Ad Librarian. And what it is, is it's a software program that will look up each link, which will bring you to the image, save the image, and put it into a folder. So you can collect images from the ad library. What we also did is we built a Python tool. Python's a uh, programming software that takes the photos in the folder runs them through uh, one of Amazon's facial detection algorithms and gives us an output like this. So here we have that same ad. We have the face. Oh, this thing isn't working. Great. <laughs> so you have, you're just seeing a uh, dark screen. Uh, it takes the, the, this is the face ID number one. If there's two people, they'll have two IDs, one and two. The predicted emotion, in this case, confused and the percentage probability that the algorithm thinks that this actually is confusion. It goes up to 99%. So you want higher ranges. This is a pretty low score, 53%, but I think you can kind of see confusion here, right? Let's look at some more examples. Angry Trump, right? You might recognize this picture that was going around. So we've got Trump predicted to be angry, but only by 44%. I think it still works. Probably it's low because it's only a side of his face. Trump, happy, 99%. Agree. Trump and Putin. Trump is calm, Putin, sad. Which is kind of interesting because I don't think Putin is actually sad, but he does kind of have sad facial features, if you think about it. And we can do this uh, for multiple politicians at the same time. And this, it starts to get messy when you have more faces, but we basically have this also in a spreadsheet for analysis. And we can look at um, supporters in a crowd and we can start to estimate how many supporters are in this crowd by the number of face IDs. And so like, this one doesn't have a box because it, it can't really predict an emotion. I think we, we only draw a box if it has 80%, but we can change that. Because I think the algorithm can't really decide what facial expression this is. It's kind of in motion, right? So we, we basically found out that uh, the algorithm does a pretty poor job if the candidate is moving. Because when you have an open mouth, it throws off the, the facial detection. So this is my favorite example from our data set. It's uh, from the State of the Union. You have Trump and Pence, totally calm. Nancy Pelosi, leader of the uh, Democrat, fear, <laughs> which is kind of interesting, with a high predicted probability of fear, 98%. <laughs> so for our data set, we collected all Facebook ads for the eight politicians that were running three weeks before Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday is a big set of, a day full of primary elections. Uh, I believe it was March 3rd. So I think we have February 5th to March 3rd, 2020. We got 205,000 ads, sounds like a lot, but only 41% of those had images. The rest had videos, and video analysis is a whole nother beast. So we're sticking with images for now. And we used the pixel dimensions of the photo to deduplicate the images. So what that means is that 
when we looked at the ads, we saw that the large majority of the images were the same. And we want to look at basically how many unique individual images are there. So it's a, it's a way to basically narrow down this 84,000 to how many individual photos are actually there. And using this pixel-based method, we got 1,279 unique images. But there was a problem in that it would count these as unique images, which makes sense. But the only reason these, these uh, pictures are different is because the text changes, right? From Rockville to Baltimore, or join us in Little Rock. But the emotion the candidate is presenting is not any different. So we have to go further in our deduplication. We have another example, Amy Klobuchar. Same picture, but because we're calculating based on pixels, it's saying that these are different, but we would consider them the same. But they are different because they have different text, but it depends on what kind of research you're doing. So we took our folder of images, we ran them through a uh, deep learning model called VGG19. And what this does is it tags, in this case, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, tags them with a bunch of dots on their faces. Like, where is their mouth? How far is everything apart? How, you know, it's like, <clears throat> probably seen something similar in like a AI presentation or something. So we ran all these photos through, <laughs> we had 1,279. It took 10 days to do this. It was pretty intensive computational stuff. And then what it does is it takes those dots and it clusters them into groups. And when we did that, we got some pretty cool results. I mean, this is like, this is like we're getting into the weeds in terms of methods, but this is really cool, I think, because it grouped these together, even though we have really different pictures. The candidate is the same, and the emotion that the candidate is presenting is the same, but the opponent is different and the text is different. So basically, the deep learning model and our clustering was able to group these together better because it's focusing on the faces, not the text, which is kind of cool. But it didn't work out for everyone, so we still had to actually put these in folders by hand, the great part of research. So we had 205,000 ads. We had 80,000 ads with images. And after we actually sorted them into how many unique pictures were there, there were only 421 that had people. About 100 of these, or maybe even less, I haven't looked at it yet, but it's something like 50 or 100 were like infographics or pictures of polar bears for climate change and stuff like that. But we're focused only on people because we want to understand emotions. Not really a lot of pictures for these 80,000 ads, right? But what we can do is we can classify these photos, take the data for each photo, and hydrate that back into the images. So we basically classify 80,000 ads by their image, but there's only 421. So we narrow down to the core images, we take our classifications, and we put them back into the larger data set. And so if you think about promote, contrast, and attack, right? promote is the candidate by themselves. Contrast is with the opponent, and attack is just the opponent. We see for both the unique number of photos and the overall number of ads, promote is the highest category. But what about the emotions, right? For just the promote category, the candidate by themselves, by far, the most communicated emotion was happiness. Smiling politicians. It's actually really funny when you look at it because like almost every ad is them smiling or happy or with supporters. And we were interested in fear. We thought maybe they were, because fear demobilizes and has these negative democratic effects, we wanted to see if there was any fear. Uh, there was a few examples, but they, they weren't really, uh, they're more like the computer picking it up. But we had a lot of happiness and a lot of calm. So it was interesting for, for Mike Bloomberg, uh, if you know him, uh, he's a billionaire, old guy, uh, really serious dude, uh, not doing much smiling. He was the calm leader. Kind of interesting. Trump, 
happiness and calm. You can think about Trump trying to be a tough guy, right? So what about the opponents? How are the opponents? So we got to think about how do politicians choose to portray their opponents in an attack? Angry. Opponents look angry. And here we also have a big category for fear from Trump. What's interesting about this, I think, is that Half of the candidates did not even have attack ads before Super Tuesday, right? We had eight, now we have four. So Biden wasn't attacking anybody before uh, Super Tuesday, at least in our data set, right? Maybe before that they were. But we see a lot of anger, we see a lot of fear, uh, and that's, that's um, about it. But what do those look like? So what does a Trump fear ad look like? All of this fear, just comes from these two photos I'm going to show you. Nancy Pelosi again. I think, it, I think the, the algorithm does a pretty good job, right? This is kind of a fear ad, I think. We had a surprise as well for a Trump attack. <laughs> Adam Schiff kind of looks surprised. And just an example from Elizabeth Warren. What does her angry ad look like? Trump. Kind of sad, kind of angry. But I think when you take into account the overall kind of color tones and everything, red, anger, I don't think the algorithm picks that up. So I think it's just looking at the face, not the color, but still predicts anger, which is pretty good. So that's that. We're going to take this data and we're probably going to expand it and we're going to look at ads versus Facebook posts and Instagram posts. And we're going to do a little bit more um, yeah, more research uh, using this tool. This is kind of just to test it and see how it performs. And um, I can already say, just by looking at the data, just happy. Everyone's just smiling all the time, which could be because we're looking at the candidates' pages. I'm sure if we're looking at like news outlets, we might get some more negative, uh, negative stuff. So I wanted to show you that because if we think about the Facebook and TV study, right, where candidates are seen to promote more on Facebook with text. We find that in our data for images, and that's kind of the scientific process, right? Validating other people's research using a slightly different method. And basically, we saw some examples of you know, nasty Biden ads, but most are just candidates smiling and asking for money at the end of the day. So that'll wrap up with that study. Uh, really good, really interesting, really the best we know about Facebook advertising, um, episode 95 of the podcast. So what the candidates actually post on social media? Well, they ask for money, they promote where they're going to be, and they ask you to vote. There's more categories, of course, but this is really the main ones, and really, when it comes to American politics, fundraising is key. So you have about five more minutes left. And I want to talk about a really important point, which is even though we have an idea about what candidates are posting, we don't know what type of effect they have. We just don't have that research. But we have plenty of other research from newspapers and radio and television. And all of that research suggests that any sort of media that someone consume is not a hypodermic needle hypodermic needle, meaning if you read something on the internet, it's not going directly into your brain and changing your ideas. This was long thought to be the case, uh, but decades of research have proven against it. Same with the magic bullet, right? A political ad is not a magic bullet to make someone vote for you. And so if we think about that, how much effect does fake news, Russian trolls, and deep fakes have on elections? Well, probably, probably not much, I think, personally. If we think about the hypodermic needle theory, it's not like you see a piece of fake news and it goes directly into your brain and you change everything you've ever thought. It's actually quite hard to persuade someone with an ad. So again, remember, TV, small effects, two-week decay. So 
I worked with some colleagues in the US and we studied these Russian trolls and what they were tweeting in the, uh, the US election. And what we found is that people would like and retweet news from trolls that were disguised as black Americans, left-wing Americans, and right-wing Americans. So when a troll was disguised as an identity, people would retweet and like that content, with black trolls being the most likely to get likes and retweets, probably because other black people on Twitter would support that person who was actually a troll. We also have this interesting category called hashtag gamer. These were trolls that uh, they would try to basically get hashtags trending by saying things like hashtag election in three words. And then they would try to get people to fill in the three words, like what do you think the election is? Like basically kind of getting things like uh, hashtag I get depressed when, and then people would fill in what they get depressed. Not so interesting. What's interesting is that these identities were most likely to be retweeted. What's interesting is that accounts that were disguised as news outlets were not statistically likely to be liked or retweeted. In short, what this is saying is that people, in, in the case of the IRA in the 2016 election, did not really retweet fake news accounts. They retweeted people who they thought were black, left-wing, or right-wing. So that leads us to think about what we call the networked disinformation model, which is you have a troll in this case, a Norwegian troll. And it disguises itself. We call these sock puppet accounts. Basically creates a false identity that sends a message that someone tweets and then other people retweet it. So we can imagine the troll disguises himself as a black person, another black person tweets it, and then other black people tweet it. I think if there's any effect of disinformation, it's gonna happen here. It's gonna happen when people are retweeting something from an authentic person, not when they're retweeting from a troll, if that makes sense. Because these people are real. Sometimes, they can be bots. But if a troll tweets something that a real person retweets, then this person thinks that person's real and might think the information is more real. Because we know that people tend to uh, listen to social media news from people that they know. So the closer that these people know each other, the more likely the disinformation from this troll might have an effect. But simply the idea that some fake news story is changing people's opinions, uh, I don't think that's supported by science. But what about echo chambers, right? Uh, if it's not disinformation, then echo chambers must be ruining society as we know it. The idea of echo chambers really comes from this 2004 study, I think, that looked at political blogs. And so this is data that shows the American blogosphere in 2004, I believe. It might have been 2008, I think it was 2004. And they saw that uh, conservatives linked to conservative blogs and Democrats read Democratic blogs. And this means that society is more polarized. No, I don't think so. We can find echo chambers everywhere, but the leap from saying that these echo chambers cause political polarization has not been proven. There's no scientific evidence for or against that yet. So going back to the idea of the sugar example, right? the echo chamber story is sweet. It makes sense. Oh, everything in the world must be the result of echo chambers. But again, if we think about how people consume media, you can't live in an echo chamber. It's almost impossible to live in an echo chamber. People get, you might find one on Twitter, but people read other platforms. They're exposed to offline media like radio in the car or uh, a TV in the airport. Like they have conversations with real people actually in real life. The idea that you can go through your life and never see uh, an opinion you disagree with is just uh, impossible to me. And the same goes for, for, you know, do echo chambers change elections? Well, we have a lot of knowledge from political science research that says that there are very, very powerful forces that predict how people vote. Things like your socioeconomic status, how much money you make, 
how much uh, knowledge you have about politics. Socialization is the biggest one probably. Um, the family you're brought into really affects your political beliefs and your likelihood to participate in politics. From the US case, the kind of standard idea, at least until recent times, was once you vote for a party three times, you will vote for that party for life. That's uh, what, the, what the science shows. People have different cognitive processing patterns. Some, some are you know, more inclined to conspiracy theories than others. We have all these factors that are important to understanding people's media habits and their likelihood to vote. To boil it down to just echo chambers is just uh, sugar, I think. If you want to hear more about what we know about echo chambers, polarization, fake news, check out episode 110. Lastly, deep fakes. This is the new narrative. Deep fakes are coming for us all. Um, they could be dangerous, definitely. We don't know. There's only one study I know of that has tested deep fakes so far. Are you familiar with this deep fake Obama video? Some of you have seen it. it calls Trump a dipshit. Um, well, they actually used this video in an experiment. And they gave people uh, three different videos. One was just the clip of Obama calling Trump a dipshit. Uh, another one was a 26 second clip that Obama starts off, or the fake Obama, uh, starts off by saying that like, we live in a time when anything can be manipulated. So it's sort of a clue that's a fake news video. And then calls Trump a dipshit. And the last one is the full video, uh, which includes, at the end, they basically say this is fake. And they asked uh, participants in this experiment, did Obama ever call Trump a dipshit? And across the three uh, conditions, the three types of videos, we find that um, basically 15%, regardless of how long the video was, uh, thought that yes, uh, Obama had called Trump a dipshit. So they were tricked. Most people weren't tricked, but some were uncertain. And what this study says, I think, the way that I read this is that most people wouldn't expect Obama to call Trump a dipshit. That's not what Obama does. But when they see this video, they're not tricked into thinking this happened, but they start to think, did Obama ever call Trump a dipshit? It sort of makes people uncertain. So think about it this way. If you see this fake video about Obama calling Trump a dipshit, he didn't say that. But maybe two months later, you might forget where you saw that. Was it a fake news video or did it actually happen? And you start to become more uncertain about, in this case, calling someone a dipshit. So what we know so far from one study is that evidence suggests that deep fakes don't necessarily deceive, but they create uncertainty and this uncertainty, in turn, lowers trust in news on social media. That's what we know about deep fakes. So I think the danger is in kind of sowing confusion, not necessarily tricking everyone to believe what the video says. So to conclude, uh, research findings about social media are not really as spectacular as the media narrative makes them out to be. So be critical of what you read in the media. We still have a lot to learn, but I think personally, the overall effect of social media on any one election is probably overstated. Social media does not win and lose elections by itself. But it is changing how politics is done in terms of campaigning if you don't overlap with the media market, right? And changing the media landscape. And I think really, when we think about social media, we have to look at it against the broader uh, social, political, and legal structures in our society, not just look at social media in and of itself. So that's it, and uh, thanks so much for, for listening.